Okay, are we live? How are we sounding, Christine? Good. Audio look good? Good evening and welcome to the Arundel Camera Club meeting for Thursday, February 2nd. My name is John Milliker and I'm club president for the 2022-2023 season. The Arundel Camera Club was founded in 1957 and exists to promote the art, science, and education in all aspects and fields of photography. For more information about us, please visit www.arundelcameraclub.org. We are so happy to be meeting in person and now online as well. If you are local to Anne Arundel County, Maryland, we encourage you to visit us at the Severna Park Baptist Church, located at 506 Benfield Road, Severna Park, Maryland. Before we move on to tonight's program, do we have any announcements? Justin, I sent out an email today to check your junk mail because it has a lot of important stuff that you're related to MPA. Okay, check, in, check your email for um, some important stuff from MPA from Ron Piper. And uh, we came in today to a thank you from Severna Park Baptist Church. It says thank you uh, to Anne Arundel County, Anne Arundel, Commuter, uh, Anne Arundel Camera Club, AACC, but it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, we appreciate you sponsoring our church fellowship last Sunday. You are always welcome at SPBC. Blessings to your continued efforts of creative art photography in our beautiful God-given creation from Pastor Dave Brown and the SPBC family. So thank you to them for sharing that with us. And thank you everyone for who came and visited us on sa uh, Sunday and for everyone who came and brought some goodies as well. We had a ton of people. I hope you saw the photos. If not, go on our Facebook group and take a look at those there. Uh, I'm going to fill up the schedule for Christine tonight, February 9th. That's next Thursday. We have a digital contest on the theme of glass. You're going to get an email from Ron as well on some deadlines. That's usually th Tuesday at noon. That's how it's been for a while. That is going to be a digital, excuse me, a virtual contest only. It'll likely be a Zoom meeting, but it'll also go over to Facebook as well. Then on Saturday, February 11th, we have a field trip to St. Michael's. On February 16th, we have a program with Lori Lankford on a theme of looks like a painting. That is, uh, I believe, April's theme in our contest. February 23rd is a color monochrome contest, again, on the theme of glass. And March 2nd is a program by Padma, I apologize if I, if I get your name wrong, Nguva on floral photography. I'm really excited about this, this, this program coming up and also the digital contest and the, the print contest on glass. That is always uh, usually pretty good. Um, I get, the, uh, I get the, the, the wonderfulness of being able to introduce myself for the program tonight. Uh, Christine's not feeling too well, so uh, so uh, our program speaker kind of sucks, but he's here anyway because Christine needed somebody. So uh, again, uh, you know who I am. Uh, I'm going to kind of get started. When Christine asked me to talk a little bit about, uh, to, to come up with a program, I originally came up with a real estate photography program. But, um, you know, the, the market's kind of gotten pretty bad lately, and uh, I really didn't have much time to prepare for. You know, a lot of real estate jobs kind of came through and then all of a sudden went kind of kind of dead. So uh, I went to my next uh, biggest passion, which, um, which is uh, drone photography and videography. But uh, I didn't start drone photography and videography without kicking and screaming first. I hated drones. I really did not like them. So therefore, I called the title, uh, How Aerial Photography and Videography Changed. I kicked and screamed the whole way. My good friend Matt said I shouldn't title it, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Drone. Hopefully you guys get the reference on that. Um, going through this presentation, I really had to go back through how I started with aerial photography. And man, it pulled up a lot of, lot of old memories. Um, so as you can read on the screen, I'm dedicating this to uh, the pilots I had the pleasure of working with who lost their lives during um, the entertainment or training of others. Warning, FAA rules are constantly changing. Be familiar with all rules and keep current. We will talk a little bit more about some of the FAA rules and guidelines for flying a drone. And, uh, and I'm sure the comment section on YouTube will, uh, will you know, tell me I'm wrong every step of the way, which is great. That's just how YouTube works. And I promise not to make this my usual history lesson, but um, French photographer Gaspard Felix Tournachon, or Nidar, as, uh, as he would become named, he would initially be convinced that aerial photography could prove invaluable for surveying, map making, and also military espionage. He will become the first person to make an aerial photograph. 
And I don't think this is the first one. I'm having a hard time finding the official first one, but this is an example of one of his first, one of his early shots uh, of the city of Paris. This is just kind of a small clip of that. And um, this was in uh, around the 1860s. So therefore he is taking a balloon up. He is taking up his dark box he is coating a plate similar to how Christine and I do with the wet plate collodion process, and he is making an image that is likely a few seconds long. There is a lot of great history with uh, Nidar, but um, we're not gonna get too deep into that. But this is a successful print from, uh, from him going up into a balloon and making an image with a, about an ISO 3 sensitivity emulsion and actually staying still enough for it as well. And not only is, um, you know, not only was that a long exposure, what are we thinking about aperture wise for this shot? Probably real small, right? Back then we really didn't, didn't have the F system how we did. We would have what were called waterhouse stops and they would, they would slide in the lenses and, and basically do the same thing, half it, quarter it, eighth it. So likely this was, um, I. I need to do more research on him because likely this was very stopped down for that depth of field on there. So pretty cool, pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna go through my journey of aerial photography, um, my progression and how each method uh, worked or didn't work for me. It all started with a rocket and a dream. This is the night, this is actually the um, this is actually the Estes Astrocam 110, and I dreamed about this camera. They also had one that came out in 1966 called the Cam Rock. Yes, it's such a cool name. Not really. But you would cut discs of film for the camera. The Astrocam 110 would use 110 roll film, and you would get one exposure per launch. Estes didn't care because you were sending up and buying those rockets anyway. But um, one shot per launch, one engine per launch. Strangely, I had neither of these. I asked Santa for them for several years and he just never brought it to me. But I always remembered, um, I always remembered my, my dream of what things look like from the sky. Now, of course, uh, in, the, uh, in the 21st century, we have a new version of the Estes Astro Cam. And this has a video resolution of 1080p and a still picture resolution of 2560 by 1440. I did not do a, uh, a megapixel count on that, if anybody's interested in getting out their calculator, but it's probably what, maybe 12 megapixels or something? Yeah, 12 or something. Yeah, so pretty cool, pretty cool. Maybe one of these days I'll, I'll get one of these Astrocam rockets and send them up. Probably have a 4K version within the next year or something. Uh, after that came KAP, Kite Aerial Photography, and that is the, uh, the idea of hanging a camera off of a kite. That little boy is not me, by the way, you can tell because he doesn't have the mustache. They're very unpredictable. They're very similar to what I would consider almost like pinhole photography. You don't know what you're gonna get. You can't tell the kite which way to go. You can just hope the wind takes it that way and you can move it, maneuver it as well. The camera is swinging around like crazy as well, and it's usually very difficult to, to actuate the shutter. Later in, uh, you know, a little bit later, they kind of figured that out. But the first thing you need to worry about is getting that, that platform for your camera as stabilized as possible. And this is what's called a peak event. And it's a special kind of way of, of lacing lines on a, the two lines of a kite and everything everything kind of works together to keep that platform stabilized. And this is a GoPro on, uh, on a 3D printed version of that. When I sent this one up, I just set it up for a time lapse. Every two or three seconds, take a shot, take a shot, take a shot, take a shot. And, uh, and that's, that's when I got, law, you know, probably 10 years ago in Ocean City, Maryland. I guess I should have asked you guys where you thought that was, but that's Ocean City, Maryland, the, the pier at the end of the boardwalk. There are newer rigs that will allow you to use remote control receiver and transmitter, and you can change the angle of the camera, and then you can also actuate the shutter. Another thing you've got here is you've got to set the angle and hope you set it right. 
So these are these are a lot of fun to play with, but um, a little bit uh, a little bit angering for a while. Um, after KAP came hot air balloons, and we were really uh, fortunate to be able to shoot media for the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta for for a few years, and. It's still unpredictable, of course, but at least I can, you know, point my camera and actuate the shutter to whenever I wanted to. Um, if you ever get a chance to to ride in a hot air balloon, I highly recommend two cameras because you do not want to be changing lenses while uh, while uh, meandering through the sky. Also, make sure you've got plenty of memory card, plenty of battery. You don't want to be messing with too much stuff because sometimes these these gondolas have little kind of kind of slits in the bottoms, and things can fall out really, really easy. When we shot as media, they would allow us to take media flights um, a couple times during the week. If you ever get a chance to go to Albuquerque or to go to a balloon fiesta or balloon festival. You can usually work as a chase crew. And what a chase crew does is as, as I'm going up or as Christine's going up in a balloon, you've got people in cars that are trying to find out where that balloon's gonna go. The balloon operator is constantly in connection with the, the car saying, hey, I'm gonna probably land in this field over here. Go and get me permission really quick. <laughs> they try to get permission. The problem with Albuquerque, Albuquerque is great because between the, you know, where that field is, and this is, this is Balloon Fiesta Field. I seem to remember them saying it was like 100 football fields big for this. The year that we went, they actually broke a record. I think it was 360 balloons launched in one hour. Hot air balloons, full hot air balloons launched in an hour. They broke a record. But up in the air, there's, you've got what's called a box, and that's why Albuquerque is just perfect for this, because the balloons rise at a certain height. They can go in one direction, they lower down, they go in another direction. On a perfect day, they can just kind of sit over that field and keep going around in a box. Really pretty cool. But what a chase crew does is, chase crew will follow them because whenever that, wherever that balloon lands, they need to get that balloon out of that property as soon as possible, get it packed up and, and you know where it needs to be. Um, yeah, but chase crew, sometimes when you help and work with them, if you've helped and work with them enough and maybe they have a seat, there is never a guarantee. But I've seen people that worked for Chase Crew and worked helping them out. All of a sudden, like the last day or last, the second to last day, they'll say, hey, I want you. Why don't you go take a ride? Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. And that's, uh, that's a full, full view of that. If you've ever been to, uh, to Albuquerque, it's, it's such a great time. Get there early. And uh, of course, this is not going to work on it. But um, you've got a, you know just just vendors all the way down and around and back up. They've got a music stage there, which is amazing. We we tried to go back last year for the 50th anniversary, but uh, we just never could make it, unfortunately. But that was a lot of fun. It was so much fun just being able to cover every single event. San uh, Albuquerque is really interesting because when you get there, it could be freezing. In the middle of the day, it could be high 80s. Sandia Peak, kind of uh, to the right of this photo. One day we, we got on the tram and it was like 88 degrees. We went up to the top of Sandia Peak on the tramway and had a snowball fight at the top of the mountain. It was really cool, but make sure you, make sure you uh, pack plenty of layers of clothes for that. How about airplanes? Um, I was real fortunate to, um, to really get in and, and run media for, for a lot of the air shows. As you can see, that's me. Uh, that's me on the left in the back of a Geico Sky Typer, and uh, I'm stuck in here in this hole in this airplane, getting ready to take a flight as well. We shot um, uh, Kirtland in Albuquerque uh, for the Ocean City, Maryland uh, air show for for ten years. We shot Ocean City, Maryland, um, uh, Wallops Island. And, uh, and my first air show ever was Thunder Over the Blue Ridge where I witnessed an airplane crash. And I think, I've, I think a, lot of, a lot of you have probably heard that story, excuse me, heard that story where I see an air crash and I'm like, man, I don't, I don't ever wanna see, I don't wanna go to an air show ever again. And, and I got a call, it's like, hey, do you wanna go up in an airplane and cover some planes doing aerobatics? And I'm like, you know, like me, okay. Just like most of you guys, probably if you have like a phobia or a fear and you get a chance to do something really cool, and be able to, you know, ride in the back of Fat Albert or something. You're, 
say yes and then worry about it later. Um, I was in a plane, I was in a different plane where they had an entire door open. And, uh, and I know a lot of people probably heard this story as well, but my, my, ha my claim to fame is likely that uh, I was up in an airplane and they told me not to stick my camera out the door because the wind will likely whisk it away and then I would have to let go and it would fall into the ocean. Well, I'm shooting all this stuff and I'm shooting all these, uh, you know, these, these two, um, two airplanes kind of doing acrobatics and the one guy goes behind the plane. Well, I can't shoot you from behind the plane, so I kind of... And I'm in, a, I'm in a harness, and I kind of have a I kind of have a harness attached to me as well. So I kind of kind of put a hand out there, and hand didn't break off. Put the camera out there. Well, about 30 seconds later, I'm actually out the door taking photos of this guy, and then I realized he was doing tricks for his own GoPro that was on the back of the back of the plane. So uh, I apologize, Mike Whiskus, if you ever watch this, but. Um, the very next year, they had a rule for all of us, which was do not exit the plane of the door of the airplane. So that's kind of my, fame, my fame, claim of fame, and I tell that story a lot, so I guess I'm probably proud of it. Um, with airplanes, and I didn't mention balloons, um, balloons are very dangerous obvious, for obvious reasons. Sadly, on average, about one person dies a year at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta because of reasons. You know, hard landings, uh, the gondolas getting tipped over, hitting, hitting power lines. It's, it's a very dangerous, dangerous sport. But, of course, airplanes are a lot more dangerous. This is um, Captain Katie Higgins. She's a Safari Park girl. And in the 69-year history of the Blue Angels, she was the first Blue Angel pilot. Want to know what plane she flew? Fat Albert, the big C-130. So here I am in Fat Albert. Sadly, I was supposed to be in the cockpit, but a big affiliate news, uh, news anchor came and kind of bumped me. So I'm in the back of this plane, and uh, they give you barf bags. You kind of wonder why they give you barf bags. And then there's these ladders in the middle of the Fat Albert, where, where all the cargo is. There's, there's seats, so we're probably this far away from the, the people lined up on this side. And I'm lined up here, there's ladders in the middle, and you're wondering why in the heck are there ladders? Why did I get a barf bag? I'm just taking a, a ride on Fat Albert. Well, Katie drove that thing like she stole it. As soon as we leave the runway, we go straight up, or at least it feels like it's straight up. And then we go straight down. And we continue to do that for probably 567 more times. I lost count after I started praying that the flight would end. But we go over the beach, and there's a tiny little little porthole right here. Uh, might have been this one back. It, yeah, I think it was this one back here. I could see people through that porthole on the beach laying on towels in, in, their, in their bathing suits. That's how close we were to the beach. But she was practicing her air show run. And I was doing good. <laughs> I was doing good until, uh, until I wasn't. And I have my camera, and and one of the uh, one of the you know one of the crew guys is doing like these tricks on these ladders as she was doing these zero g dives. These guys are floating and doing all these tricks for us in the ladder, and the guy's like, "Oh, get this, get this," and I'm I'm not doing good, so I go, "Great," didn't even see what the photo was. So I had a guy across from me, and it's weird how this unspoken rule happens. Where look. If, I'm, if you're good, I'm good. So you kind of like, you know, everybody's hurting, but you kind of look at your guy. And I'm watching my guy, and I'm watching my guy, and I'm praying to the Lord that this flight ends soon. My guy went, that was it. That was it. I will say that I had a dry barf bag, but dry heaving was a big thing. And then when we land this sucker, she goes up one last time, plummets to the earth, and lands it. And, uh, and then, of course, the, blue, the, the Navy guys are laughing that they had 12 people vomit, had 12 barf bags full. So they, they had a good time with that. Uh, quite literally, ups and downs. Uh, like we did, <laughs> I'm going to get emotional on this, like we, did, uh, like we did for several years, we would go to Ocean City, we would work at the Ocean City Airport, and uh, then we would fly to Wallops, we would not fly, we would drive, they wouldn't fly us, we would drive to Wallops Island, and one year we just happened to be able to uh, meet these two, two great gentlemen on the right, and that is Captain Jeff Cuss and uh, his chief, uh, 
what was the official name of that show? Crew Chief, Crew Chief A01, Eli Lang. Uh, the year after, the, the guy on the left, Jeff Cuss, uh, he, um, he went into a turn a little too fast, and, uh, and instead of ejecting, they think that he brought the, uh, he brought the, uh, the plane down and crashed into a field to spare, to spare an apartment complex. But, um, but the, uh, the year before that, uh, you know, they, they awarded Christine and I these, these really cool certificates. I mean, we worked with them all week. It was really cool. It was really cool being, being with them. <coughs> and uh, not always do you, um, do you get to, pl to fly chase plane. This is, flying in, uh, this is flying in an actual stunt plane doing the stunts. And they can't do this when they have the performance, but they can do this when they have the, uh, the practice sessions. Uh, I will play this video. Nobody linked my mother in on this because she does not think that, uh, she freaked out when she heard I rode a helicopter. But, um, you know, this, this was, you know, one of the most talented pilots uh, I had worked with. And, you know, we're doing these Cuban 8s. Uh, at some point in here, in this short video, you know, we go up and wait for the plane to stall and fall back to the earth, which is probably not a good thing. And then several, several, several barrel rolls. Um, as far as my mother, um, I, I told her that these were planes and helicopters that were fully uh, okay and ready to go. I didn't tell her that these were highly experimental planes, uh, antique planes and, and things like that. But uh, that was quite a cool video. Um, that plane was um, Greg Connell and it was a highly customized biplane that was uh, highly powerful. He called it the Wolf Pits. And um, what was, when was that? In May of 2016, he crashed and died at the Good Neighbor Day Air Show. Was that a special? It was a highly, highly modified, but because he called it a Wolf Pits, it had to have you know, a lot of the pits in it. DeKalb Peachtree Airport, Atlanta, uh, May of 2016. Um, I got a chance to fly with the Geico Sky Typers uh, in their SNJ World War II trainers, and uh, I got to scroll down here. You know, it's it's sad when you when you love something and and you you lose so many people. Um, in September of uh, 21, uh, in uh, in the the Poconos, actually in Wilkes Bar Airport, uh, Polly Andy uh, Travnicek, which is actually plane number three, will be the plane next to me. He. Uh, he crashed and he crashed and died there. Um, funny story about the SNJs and the Geico Sky Kuiper Typer team. They were really cool. Um, they put me in the plane and it's it's a metal shell. It's almost like a bicycle frame and then like metal shells around it. And I could see all the like all the wires moving and I have pedals and a thing. It's like yeah, it'd be good if you didn't touch any of that stuff. And then he puts me in a puts me in a parachute. He says, well, this is for, you know, this is for the insurance, but we're flying so low that if we have to dump out and, and bail, you're going to hit the, hit the, the, you're going to hit the water at like 200 miles an hour before parachute even thinks about opening. And he says, but anyway, we're flying with the cockpit open. It was cool because I had the radio and I'm, I'm directing the sky typers because I'm getting the shot over Ocean City. And he says, yeah, don't pull this thing here. So he comes and he, he gets off his ladder and this, and I'm looking, I'm like, huh. And the thing just goes, <laughs> um, yeah, it does that every once in a while. And he shoved it back up. It was pretty cool. Um, and um, and one of my one of my my favorite photos, and uh, probably one of my you know one of the the most famous photos from from our time with the Ocean City Air Show. This is just when they rebuilt the beer the, the pier after the hurricane, and uh, I had the. Uh, I had the Air National Guard duo planes coming through. They're now flying. Uh, they're now flying the Jack Links, the the, the beef jerky. They 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 reskin their planes for their sponsors. But these this was for an Air National Guard. And I'm coming down. I'm coming down. I'm coming down. I'm waiting for that pier to be right there, so that I can frame it. And this photo won um, not only my class in the Maryland DC photo uh, press, uh, press awards, which was uh, Division C, it was the Daily Times for uh, the paper in Salisbury, but it also went to win best in show, beating out like Baltimore Sun and you know, Washington Post, all the, all the big names in, Washington, in uh, Maryland DC.
It was really cool. Really an honor. It was kind of funny because we were on a trip somewhere, photo trip somewhere, and the, the, the uh, editor at Daily Times calls me and says, hey, can you stop by? We've got, we got something for you. And I'm like, what is it? It's like, well, there, we have these press awards and you won something. And I go and it's the first place and it's the best in show. It was really cool. Really cool. All right, let me get on with the with the why we're here. Why did I hate drones? I didn't like the quality. I gotta tighten this up. I didn't like the quality. I didn't expect there was a challenge to be had. And let me go back to the quality thing. I mean, back then you're talking probably eight, 10 megapixels. You're talking video that maybe was 720p. It was kind of, you know, kind of when photography started. It was a flying camera in the skies, and I never really got the idea that I would like to fly drones just because. But um, I didn't like the quality. As I said, I didn't think there was going to be a challenge. I mean, you know, the thing hovers by itself. You could push a button, and it comes back here, and it'll sit. And it'll, you know, it'll, it'll bag and everything else. Uh, I didn't like the thought of me not hanging out of an open airplane door. Oh, Christy would like that. I didn't like the noise of other people's drones. Before, before all this, it was kind of like a, it was kind of like the Wild West out there for drones, because we didn't have rules like no drones in national parks, no drones in some state parks. And we went out to Valley of Fire, which is a Nevada state park, and there were drones everywhere, and it was annoying. You know, little micro chainsaws. It was so annoying. I just didn't like them. Um, I think that's it for that one. Yeah, there we go. Um, as I said, the, the early, early days were a wasteland of no rules, and while we're closer now, with, uh, as far as the rules are concerned, we're not, we're not perfect. Uh, we're not overly, overly policed either, which is kind of both, both good and bad. Uh, what changed my mind? I kind of had, um, had money burned a hole in my pocket, and uh, I wanted a, a, a way to capture some of our events. Now, of course, uh, an example of capturing some of our events, I, I put a photo up of an aerial shot at uh, Antietam National Park Service, but this is not a drone shot. This is one of those Mr. Mr. Longarm 28 foot fiberglass poles with a 360 camera on it. But it kind of kind of put the idea out there. We just wanted a new way to, to just highlight where we were and where we had our, our everything set up. And once we got that, we were, we were kind of happy about it. Um, it was also an easy way to add aerial photography to our kind of our offerings to our customers, whether it was a, it was a wedding shot. A big thing is wedding shots, and, and they want an aerial photo in front of this or that, or, um, or real estate makes it a lot, makes it really, really easy. And um, a lot of people did find us via our air show work. Whenever I asked people about us, they found us some, some way or the other. So it was real easy kind of adding aerial stuff to our repertoire and then, uh, and then working with that. And then I read about like FAA coming out with some rules that were basically if you were in furtherance of a business, you need to have a commercial pilot's certificate. It's not really called a license. And, um, but you know, we, we kind of went into that. We'll talk about 107 a little bit. When people ask me why do they, 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 when people tell me they want a drone, I ask them why. Why do you want a drone? I see so many people that get a drone for fun. Oh, I just want to take a photo of this. Take a photo once, they put it away, they're done with it. Some people like flying them. I'm not one. I'm not one of those. If I have a job, I love flying it, I love getting the shot, I love landing it, and I love putting it back in the bag. So you kind of think about are you going to use it or are you going to continue to use it? Do you have things to photograph? Um, and, and of course the big one is, are you photographing for, uh, for yourself or are you photographing for the furtherance of a business? This is what it looks like to actually fly a drone. When you, when you have this, this controller here, when you have this controller here, you can put a phone or I have a big tablet. I've got a tablet called a triple tech. And it's, it's got so much brightness, the sun can be hitting the tablet and I can still read it perfectly. So I've got a big tablet on the phone and I'm actually looking through, through this while I'm, while I'm working everything. And I have all my settings there. I'm, in, um, I'm actually in RAW right now, uh, eight thousandth of a shutter speed. Of course I just changed settings so I have no idea what we're doing. I'm changing all my camera stuff. 
changing my white balance. It's, a, it's basically a flying camera. You can see the zebra strikes, stripes, but I, I allow the zebra strikes to come up um, just a little bit. And then I bring the exposure down. That looks like what I'm doing right now is, is kind of bringing them a little bit more back. Um, as I'm doing this, uh, I, I kind of need to make sure of a couple things. I need to make sure there are no rules in the town against drone flights. Although that's kind of contested because the thought is as soon as you clear the last blade of grass, you're in FAA jurisdiction. You're no longer in where you're at. And there's going to be a lot of court cases fought, won, and lost about that. I need to go through my checklist. I need to make sure that my, uh, that my props are set. Do I have my batteries charged? Um, are there, am I allowed to legally fly via the FAA in this area? Um, are there any uh, what are called uh, TFRs, temporary flight restrictions? Sometimes the president flies up to Delaware and there's this giant, giant ball in the air that you can't, you can't go into. Um, usually, and I had already done this, this is actually my like, third flight of, the, of, uh, of this, this property, which is, by the way, it's the UFO Welcome Center in Bowman, South Carolina, I think it is. I can't remember. Remind me to talk about that place. <laughs> um, but when I first take a drone off, I will go in and I will fly like crazy a few feet off the ground because if I want to, if I have a prop that's going to come off or if I have something that's going to happen or a prop that's going to snap, I want it to happen as, as soon as possible while the drone is still, still down. I can really go into this video. Where is it? That's overexposure. Yeah. That's the overexposure of the scene. And typically, um, I don't mind a little bit of overexposure. I'm probably shooting bracket. Actually, I'm probably turning bracketing on now. Actually, I'm going into video now, and uh, that way I can kind of come on. With the darn zebra stripes, I can't see nothing. There we go. How am I supposed to set this video up, Christine? I don't know. PowerPoint is not, oh, there it is. There's a little, a little doodad. And yeah, PowerPoint doesn't like videos apparently. Yeah, that's really weird, let's move on. Drones for personal use, drones for personal use is a lot of fun. What can you use them for? Flying for fun, enhancing your travel photos and videos, and also racing an FPV. What is the difference between this drone and like a racing quad or an FPV? Um, let's talk about it right now. Quads, drones, UAS, unmanned aerial systems, drones, uh, they're all the same. They're all pretty much the same thing. This is a DJI, I think DJI works out well. There are some restrictions with DJI because it is a Chinese company and you know, um, even though the US government uses and a lot of towns use them, they try to ban them but they still use them. It's kind of a crazy thing. This drone, I can tell it to, I could tell it to hover and it will hover. I could take it up in the sky, I can point it at an object and I could tell it to take a time lapse of that object and it will as best as it can with its GPS built in, it will try to stay in that exact same spot. Now of course with air and wind and everything, that's, that's gonna, gonna change. But the thing is, I can let go of the controls and this thing is not going to do anything. I can then set it so that hey, if I lose connectivity, I want you to fly as high as you can, which is 400 feet for drone people. I want you to come back to where I launched you and I want you to land right here because if something happened, something happened. Don't do that on a boat because uh, you'll never be back where you, where you took off from. Racing and FPV quads and drones basically are not that way. Now DJI has got one called the Avada, Avada uh, where you can switch between each one, but racing quads, you are constantly giving it the uplift. You're constantly raising it up. You're constantly moving. At, I can't flip this thing, but you know those racing guys can flip a, a quad like nothing. Racing and, uh, and FPV as well. Again, I don't fly these for fun, so I, I've, one of these days I'm gonna try one, but I don't fly these for fun, so it really doesn't, doesn't float my boat. Yes, do we have a question? Anthony asks, I'm thinking about getting one for work, roofing business. Most of our buildings are government buildings. We aren't allowed to have them on military bases. We still want to learn everything and get the pilot certificate. Is that something we can get through you? 
No, I cannot. We will talk about that, Anthony, because uh, I'm kind of in the same in the same boat with you. But let me first start. Uh, let's go through the personal, and then we'll we'll hit that in the in the commercial. Um, for personal use, we have first of all art, and you know, any course angle, any height, you can set this camera up in the sky. You can set your composition how you want. If you're into videography, you can slowly pan up. Uh, I think this is Cape May Lighthouse. You can slowly pan, but anywhere you can fly within legal limits up to 400 feet, you can photograph and you can place your drone where you need it to be to get that photograph. You can bracket, you can HDR, you can, uh, you can tape time lapses, hyperlapses. And there's even software where when I go into the commercial, I can record a macro of all the places I've flown, all the photographs or video I've took, and I can play that over and over and over again. As far as personal photography, you can make these. Uh, if you make these for prints, um, if you're selling stock, if you're selling photography or videography stock, um, you will need a commercial license because as I, was, as I will talk about, it is a furtherance of a business. The FAA hired really good lawyers to, to bring that term furtherance of a business to need your commercial pilot's certificate because that can mean anything. I can fly my drone and give it to this church, not see a penny for that work, but it's a furtherance of somebody else's business. Now, as far as nonprofits are concerned, I think there's a gray area there. Um, the thought also is if you're uploading your videos to YouTube and there's ads on that, you are furthering a business. If YouTube's getting the money or if you're getting the money, furtherance of a business. Now, this, some of you might remember, um, can drones be used for art? This is the photo that won first place in the limited photos last year. I think it's an okay image, but I think the kicker is that it's just something new. It's a different perspective. I think that really took this image above the top, you know, past the, past the finish line for last year because it is a unique, unique uh, view. Can drones give you that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this, uh, this we just shot, uh, what, last week? This is Northside Park in Ocean City, Maryland. I think it's 124th Street, and it's a beautiful park to, uh, to, to get sunsets at. Some of you might remember this place. Anybody remember what this, where this place was? This is Spruce, what? Oh, Christine, you can't answer. This is Spruce Knob Lake in West Virginia where we did the, uh, where we did the, the field trips for the club for a couple times. And uh, we photographed Neowise from that, from that tower right there. Uh, Beth and Cheryl and um, Paul were all with us with that. And this is, you know, kind of just, just an idea of what, you know, what you could do. Any, anywhere in that, anywhere in that video sequence, you can, you can focus your drone, you can photograph, and you can just sit there and do that. Uh, I don't talk about times in here, but a drone like this will be up, they say 30 minutes, but you really don't wanna do, you know, you really wanna kinda start thinking about bringing it home about 20 minutes. Yes, Fred? Is that a 4K or what? The question was, if this is 4K, this is 4K. This drone will do 4K 60 frames per second. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Now it'll do 120 frames per second in 100 1080p, which I love because um, when we did our New Jersey trip last year, I was able to get down and I was photographing some surfers in slow motion from the air. It was really, really cool. As far as batteries are concerned, uh, if, you, if you like fail videos, and I'm gonna mention a guy at the end, but uh, there was a video of somebody that took their drone out and they used up half their battery flying out over the ocean to like a cruise ship or something. Problem was the wind, the wind was following them out. So coming back, sploosh, down the ocean it went. There's a lot of drone fail videos. Uh, this is an example of what a, what a drone racing course looks like. Again, not my cup of tea. Usually the real-time video, it needs to be have no latency whatsoever, which means no delay. And therefore the, co the, the copy of um, what you're seeing through the camera, the drone, is very low resolution. But these people fly these things like crazy. I do not have the dexterity for any of that. It's like playing Quidditch. <laughs> Probably do. All right, drones for commercial use. I already talked about FAA being smart and the furtherance of a business. 
Uh, again, giving footage to a business, giving footage to a nonprofit may be a gray area. Uh, I knew some photographers that would give away a free drone photo if you booked a wedding. Um, it's, it's just easiest to, to go ahead and go through the course. The course was easy. You pay like $175. You get and if you get a if you get a uh, if you get a course for that, which you'll pay maybe 150. That's a lifetime thing because FAA is always changing the rules, and you want somebody that gives you a lifetime course that's going to be there. And I've got a link for somebody that I really like, and uh, and they let me use a uh, they let me give you guys a a percentage 30 percent off coupon for that. Uh, what ways are drones used in commercial applications, or better yet, to make money? But first, I want to say that just like photography, drones aren't perfect. This is a this is footage that I photographed of the uh, the beach ball tower in Ocean City, Maryland. What I want you to look for is I want you to see I want you to look for these black bars that are come up um, coming up. And the reason those black bars are going to come up is because I am stabilizing this footage in in post. Drones are pretty good at uh, at staying and doing what they need to do. But as soon as you get some wind gusts everything kind of goes crazy. So you definitely need, and we talk a little bit about software at the end, but we definitely need a little bit of help with, with your stabilization and your coverage. Uh, weather, uh, weather definitely makes a, a problem with that. Yes, Christine, we have a question from Facebook. Online, Harry asks, do you have to renew for the, if you change drones for the license? Uh, you do not have to renew the light, the, the certificate, the 107 certificate, but you do have to register your drone, which is why I've got, I've got my numbers here and uh, I've got numbers on my drone and, and ways people can reach me. You need to register your drone whether you're doing it for personal or commercial use. I think it's $5, it's five years. You put a number on that. The, the problem was is they were having issues where drones were, people were flying drones at night, they were getting, I think, uh, I think in one city a couple of years ago, one uh, one almost hit a police helicopter. You know, uh, there's people that are for, there's people that are against, but for five bucks, you put a number on your drone, don't fly it like an idiot, don't put it where it doesn't need to be, you're fine. But for every one, you need to pay that registration fee. If you already have, if you've already taken your trust, T-R-U-S-T, personal kind of before you fly, you should really do this and have the certificate. Or if you, you fill out and do your 107 uh, pilot certificate, uh, you, once you got that, you got that. Now the 107, you have to renew every 24 months, but that's free. They upped the price for the, for the first part of the test, and now everything's free and online. And when I was studying for my 107, I'm not gonna name names, I was studying for my 107, and I mirrored a friend that already went and got his 107, and he took his own. So what happened was we 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 did a uh, we did a Jitsi call, and I watched his screen, and he got every question wrong. But they let you take it again. Oh well, you got the que you know three questions wrong on this. Okay, we'll do it again. And it's hard because there's so much weird stuff in these FAA. I mean, there's stuff in there that that I we have a friend named Dom, and uh, he's a helicopter pilot for the Maryland State Police. And I'm asking him questions. He's like, why do you got to learn that? Why do you got to learn a sectional chart? Or why do you got to learn a, 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 a METAR? And I'll show you some examples because it's kind of crazy. I think they just want to make it seem like you're getting something for your money. But I, I've had my license for over, what, two, maybe a year and a half now. And I've never used these things. News coverage? We were coming back from Ocean City and somebody might have flicked a cigarette butt and started a big old fire. So we, I, hey, see smoke up ahead. I have to have the drone in, in there. So we parked up here. I sent the drone over and got a little bit of coverage of this, uh, of this fire. I got some video too of the firefighters putting it out. But, you know, uh, as long as you stay far enough away, you're not going to bother people. But uh, you got to be real careful because there's things what are called TFRs, temporary flight restrictions. And if there's some kind of an active investigation, they may, they may throw one up. But you gotta be real careful about where you fly. Don't bug anybody, don't bother anybody. Uh, I was gonna put a myths kind of section in, the, in here, but a lot of people think that just because they see one outside their house, that, they, that it's got a zoom lens that's, that's peeking in your bedroom window. 
These drones have wide angle lenses on purpose. Not that they're not gonna have zoom lenses in the future, but um, in order to see through a window, it's gotta, be, it's gotta be real close to a window. Move on, does anybody remember the, uh, the Harpers Ferry train derailment? Here's uh, you know, Harpers Ferry National Park right here. And, uh, and National Park is off limits for flying drones. Thankfully, I'm really happy about that. But I took off and I was flying um, outside of National Park property. There is a gray area to National Park property. National Park, you cannot land or take off a drone in National Park property. Nor can you operate a drone in National Park property. So some people can sit there, and, I've, and I definitely nicked the corner of this. This was many years ago. But some people are like, well, if I'm outside a National Park and I fly in, I don't land, I come back, I'm okay. Well, National Park kind of got smart where they have now, they can say, well, you were disturbing the wildlife. So National Park has a way to get you. I kind of like it, I can respect it. Um, when we were, we were at uh, one of our last gigs, I talked with one of the National Park Service, um, poli you know, their, their police force there. And I just asked them what their thought was. And they said, you know what, it, 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 which is exactly what I thought. People do that, it, it ruins the enjoyment. You don't want to hear that noise. I mean, drones have been get, getting a lot quieter, but they're annoying and loud and big pains in the butts. If I move on, this is uh, kind of the video. We, we, this was actually in the end of 2019. We were staying in a camp cabin. Christine went to New York, brought home COVID for us. So I got to enjoy that in a camp cabin in a bathroom about the size of this lectern here. But uh, kind of gives you an idea of what, you know, what, just, just getting this up. Previously, you know, what do you have to do? You had to have a news agency go out there and, and fly a helicopter and, and get all the shots that you wanted. Pretty crazy, pretty crazy stuff. While we are talking about other people in the air, drones are kind of like, uh, you know, drones give way to everything, even birds. We went out to Red Rock, um, Red Rock, or is it Red Rock Canyon in Nevada? They allow drones, Valley of Fire does not. And I started flying my drone and um, these little cliff swallows started dive bombing it. And I'm like, yeah, I better, I better take that out of the sky pretty quickly. Got a, got yeah, a question, Harry Christine? was asking if you have any tales of drones actually being taken down by birds. Um, just last week, there is a video where a, I think it was a hawk, snatched a drone out of the, uh, out of the air and the drone and, and, and maneuvered it just enough so that the hawk is kind of picking at the camera and the camera can see the hawk. Um, I don't know how, I don't know if the, the, the drone pilot got the drone back, but you can actually have the, the, the software kind of put a, um, kind of a lower quality video on your phone. So let's say you're flying a drone, you're recording the video a little bit to your phone, but really it's recording on a memory card, the high resolution. Then if you ever lose it, you can kind of get help getting it back. The GPS reports that I can hit a button and it'll start beeping for me. But uh, there's a little bit of recovery options there, but yeah, um, Charlie Brown, uh, the, the trees always ate his kites. Well, the trees uh, love drones. And I like the thought that a tree never hits a drone except in self-defense. Here's one of the photos. This is a photo that we used for the, uh, uh, for the incident, kind of given the, you know, given the the valley there and, uh, and how the train tracks were and then, the, and then the mess on that side. Inspections, and this kind of goes with Anthony's shot, um, Anthony's question. Yes, uh, we've been getting kind of big into inspections and the, the big thing about that is I'm not an inspector. So what I do is I've got a big tab, I talked about that, that triple tech tab, I've got a big tab button, I will sit there with the project coordinator and, and I will have them direct me what they wanna see. And I'll either take high resolution photos or I'll shoot 4K 60 video and I will get around and inspect as, as much stuff as I can. This is a water tower with communications, with cell communications on top and an Osprey decided to leave to uh, create a nest up there so we went up there to try to figure out what kind of a nest it was, and uh, at some point I go down a little bit. You can see a crab shell in there. That osprey's got uh, that osprey's got a good good taste. And then right here is something something fuzzy, probably a rodent or something. So a little surf and turf 
for the uh, for the Osprey. And I yes, sir. Uh, you to actually take the picture off the video, or, or is it two separate? It's two separate things. I can I can set it in picture mode, or I can set it to video mode. Picture mode, I believe, is um, I believe the, the it's it's twenty one megapixels, which is like sixty two something on the longest side. If I pulled it from four K video, that's only thirty eight sixty on the longest side. So it's really not ideal. And there's dinner. Well, what's left of dinner? Another big thing, and, and getting back to Anthony's thing, especially for, for roofing, um, I need to figure it out, but there are a lot of people and a lot of roofing companies that can, and there's software that you can take photos of a roof and it will actually estimate the square footage of the shingles and everything you need for that roof. Um, inspections can also go up where a ladder might not want to be able to go up or be quicker or cheaper than, than a, uh, sending somebody up there and just kind of figuring out, is, is flashing on a pipe um, cracked? Is there a damaged shingle? Something fun like that. Uh, one of my favorite things is line mapping. And um, this is a lot of fun because I get to take the, the raw footage and what they'll do is they'll, they'll map out exactly where everything is. And I use uh, a piece of software called Adobe After Effects. And, uh, and what it'll do is it'll, uh, I'll, make, I'll make points along that line and as I rotate around there, it, it follows that so that you can give, uh, you can give clients a, a rotating video with their, with their point lines intact. And every, uh, you know, when you're talking about a video, you're talking about maybe 30 to 60 frames a second. So every five, 10 seconds, depending on the project and how, how difficult it is, you just go in there and clean up those, those markers and it, and it works out really, really good. Uh, ortho mosaics are a lot of fun, and we usually do a lot of this stuff with communities. This is a community called Wingate, and the way this works, and I, I tried to find a photo of of something, but if you take a if you take a 360 degree photo right here, what's going to happen is when you start seeing the the houses up here or the houses down here, you're not going to see them straight on. What you're going to see is you're going to start seeing them at an angle, at an angle, at an angle. So what an ortho mosaic does is I'll actually fly a crisscross pattern over the entire property, and I will uh, kind of like a panoramic shot. I will overlap all those things. So therefore, what will happen is I'll have an entire neighborhood or entire project of video of, of photos, and every single house is going to be um, as as straight up and down as as humanly possible. This is this community up top is not this community, this actually goes from here, this road down to the next road. So that's why these, uh, when I delivered it to the client, I, I, cut, it the, I cut the sidewalk usually. And, uh, but you can see kind of how the houses are, you can see the, the, the sides, but all of these, I think I flew the road and then several crisscrosses back and forth inside of that. But, that's, um, but that uses a piece of software that takes several hours to, to figure out and patch them all together and to make them all straight top-down shots. But it's very similar to what Google does with satellites. And when you're, depending on the client you work with, you can actually use GIS, which is Google Image Services. And just like Google Street View and the photos you can put on businesses inside Google Maps, you can kind of do the same thing. You can kind of update these things. That way, if someone is uh, building a property, like you'll see in a little bit, you can constantly update them on that and they can not only see the, the, the whole entirety of the Google Maps, but they can see their progress on top of that as well. Oh, and speaking of, progressions. This is, uh, this is a little progression project I've got that, uh, that is almost done, but when you fly through a progression, remember I told you about how the, the drone moves with the air. And, uh, and I'm working on trying to come up with a, with a script that'll run on the drone that will, that will kind of help a little bit with this. Because if you look at these photos that I've fixed in Warp, uh, you know, those photos are all over the place. So I'm trying to figure out a way to do that. But this is a progression photo that's been kind of uh, stabilized. Wood roof up top, just the, uh, just the metal structures, and then moving, moving forward, moving forward moving forward, moving forward. 
And what I usually do is I put that in the, the images and I'll put them in a folder that clients can just download. They could tell me I want something every week, every two weeks, every month, and I'll put it in a folder by date and they, they always have access to my cloud folder and every time they see something new, they'll get an email. Um, and then I'll also make an animated GIF, which I'll do like 0.5, usually 0.2 or 0.5 seconds between images, that way they can kind of see the progression. What does it take to be a FAA 107 certified what does it take to be? To be FAA 107 certified for commercial operation. Uh, requirements as of right now is over 16 years of age, read, speak, write, and understand English, be in physical and mental condition to safely fly a drone. Okay. Exam of 60 questions, questions and a pass of 70% or higher. What's that, like 42? $175 every 24 months, you've gotta go online and, and do a recurring test but that test is free. And as I said, you know, don't, don't game the system, but I had a friend go through and get a lot of questions wrong. And because like I said, you, you just, you don't keep up on this stuff. And it's not like they're gonna fail you and take your, take your, your certificate away. Can I study for the 107 with free resources? Yes, and that's what I tried to do because I'm cheap and I don't like spending money. And I found resources that were old, I found resources that were changed, I found resources that were just incorrect. Uh, I highly recommend taking an in-person or online course. Information is scattered, old, new, rules change. Find a resource that uh, offers the rules that are as they are now, as they are that you're gonna take the test now, and uh, updates every time the rules change. I recommend giving yourself about two weeks. That was with me studying every day, a couple hours a day, and really I could have done it in one week. Find a resource that has good online tests, and it's kind of funny. You kind of feel like a complete traitor and imposter because you go into an FAA testing facility, so it's this government building with, with just depressing color walls and all those little partitions and all the cameras and, and all the spyglass and make sure you're not cheating. Well, the problem is they're, they're training real pilots in there. They're giving real pilots tests. So I feel like a complete putz for going in and taking, you know, taking a test to fly a toy around, you know, all near these like real pilots. So it was kind of, it was kind of funny. Here are some of the <coughs> silly things that you need to learn. You need to learn uh, sectional charts and airspace classification. You must learn them. Uh, I. I've never looked at a sectional chart since I passed my test. You need to know the class on airspace, you need to figure out uh, the visual towers, mountains, lakes, uh, other landmarks for pilots, restricted or military airspace. Uh, let's do a sectional chart. This is, this is BWI right here, section you know, right here, BWI. And uh, I'll go to the next slide here. This is like an upside down wedding cake. And from here, uh, in this first circle, there will be uh, there will be something somewhere. I can't figure it out right now. I have to look at it a little closer. But from here to a certain area, that's where your your restricted airspace is. Um, and then the next tier, and the next tier, because planes are coming down, they're not staying at this low tier. And John, yes. Yeah, the tops of the airspace. I'm sorry, I'm a commercial pilot. Oh, there they are, 464. Yeah, it's it's 10,000 feet to the top. And um, down to 2,500 feet in that particular place. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's coming back. 10,000, and then you add the two zeros. Lower and lower, correct. Right. Thank you. And within BWI, it's all the way down to the surface of the ground. Right. From here to, um, yeah, surface to 10,000. Right. Nice. What's that concentric circle that's well, different airspace. It's like upside down, but right. airspace. Let me go to the next one because this is it right that's, here. You see the bottom of the class? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's over But see how it looks like an upside down wedding cake? Right. But the thing is, drones are not gonna not allowed to fly over 400 feet. So really you're worried about the surface well, too. But if I make a, a <laughs> as a commercial pilot, I do a lot of flight training when I'm here. I've had several but you, out, but it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not supposed to fly under 500 feet. No, it's not me. They're up in the night. Oh, they're in, they're over 400. That sucks. Yeah. Well, it happens. That's terrible. And it's very, very restricted. This airspace. Yeah. Here. I've had it happen on the eastern shore. 
I thought it happened down in Carolina or something. It goes on. There's not enough regulation. Yeah, what we're talking about is uh, she's a she's a, a commercial pilot. She's found she's found planes up in her airspace, which starts at 500 feet, and we'll talk a little bit about bad actors as well. Oh my goodness! Oh. Now, when I go back now, as far as drones are concerned, you can go over 400 feet if the, an object if an object in proper airspace is like let's say there's a tower that's 500 feet, you can go over that in order to get over the tower. Yeah, but right. the problem is, the problem is, is you're not, you're, you won't be anywhere close. So if you're seeing drones, they're definitely not doing what they should be. Absolutely. METAR and TAF reports, you know these, I don't. I had to learn them. So let's, let's uh, read this, uh, let's read this uh, report. In uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, forecast prepared on the fifth day at 1130 UTC. Forecast valid from the fifth day at 1200 UTC to 1200 UTC on the sixth. Wind 140 degrees true at eight knots, visibility five statute miles, and it goes on. It's simple, right? You guys, are you guys following along? The KM or the KOC? The KOC, KC. OKC is the airport code for Oklahoma. Uh, the BR means missed. You know, makes sense, right? Broken clouds. It's French. Is it French? Is that why it's BR? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, this is the silly stuff. And it's kind of crazy because when you watch a video on it and you take a couple of the practice tests, you're like, oh, I can read these now. But if you don't use it, you lose it. So that's why I can't, I can't read it anymore. Were Those were weather reports, yes. Becoming, you know, these are, these are all your days. Becoming... Um, yeah, TIS is yeah. terminal area forecast, so some of them are forecast, some of them are occurring. Right. Uh, what happens when somebody doesn't follow the rules? Um, not much, sadly. There's a big question mark because, because uh, even though we say thankfully there are laws to protect drone pilots and the general public, because as a drone pilot, I'm a general public before a drone pilot. Because that's why I hate them so much. I don't want to listen to them at, out there. I don't want to see them, you know, crash into things. And now, as a as a as a pilot myself, I don't want to see some Yahoo break the rules and then cause problems for the rest of us. Um, during COVID, and I say this a little tongue in cheek, board FAA agents were on the lookout on YouTube for violations. Thankfully, unless the violation was really egregious, um, they were kind of giving people a warning and saying, "Look." The rules are new, let me kind of educate you on what you did wrong and make sure you're doing okay. Um, when the FAA doesn't act, there are usually plenty of good drone pilots that try to keep people from doing anything stupid. And if you don't believe me, wait a week, as I said earlier, wait a week and look at the comments on this video on YouTube and I'll prove my point probably. Thankfully, there are laws on the book. If I get the mouse working, oh darn it. Thankfully, there are laws on the book about national parks, which we already covered, so I don't need to talk about that again. Um, desktop programs that I use for drone flying, I use Topaz AI Sharpen and Topaz AI Denoise, or even the, the new photo AI, which is really cool, which has Sharpen, Denoise, Gigapixel, all built in. And really you want to, because you need to make sure it's kind of like your, it's kind of like your, uh, your movement rule. If you're shooting at one fiftieth of a, of a, if you're shooting at fifty millimeter, you want a handheld at one fiftieth of a second or, or faster. Kind of the same thing for drones. They're not perfectly glued up in the sky. You need to make sure you're 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 slow. Uh, and in fact, I use a I use a program when I when I do my crisscrosses for that ortho mosaic, I have to dr stop my drone, move to the next location, stop. You know, the wind will move it around so it'll fight the wind, and when it gets that GPS lock. Photograph, move to the next, photograph. Uh, if you don't do that, you're gonna get a little bit of, of, of motion blur. So you're gonna get that a little bit. You might wanna take your ISO up and that's where denoise will help out a lot. Um, drones do great panoramas. Not only do they do a, uh, they do like a 360, which isn't a 360, it'll shoot like down, up, up, move, down, up, up, move, down. It'll kind of do that all the way down, up. Drones can only look so high up. It's like 20 degrees, the DJIs can go 20 degrees up and depending on uh, the drone, 20 degrees up, may, you may see the props, you may, this one you don't. Uh, and then you just go into Photoshop and you put the dome 
you can you can Photoshop the dome in. But uh, PT GUI is good for that. It also does you know uh, landscape or horizontal panoramas or like what's called a 180, and it'll do a bunch of a bunch of shots on, on a 180. Uh, PT GUI is very expensive. I think it was two ninety nine for the for the pro version. Um, uh, Hugen is a free version, but I don't really recommend that. That doesn't seem to work anywhere near as good. Uh, Adobe Lightroom does pretty well for panoramas, and um, but it won't do the three sixty stuff. But it'll do kind of you know horizontal or vertical panoramas. Microsoft Ice has not been been updated for a long time, but you can still usually find a copy. Some people swear by it. I I didn't I didn't find it to work very well for me, but I want to throw it in there because like I said, some people swear by it, but they're probably cheaper than I am and just make it work. Um, Photomatix Pro, which a lot of us probably know, I use that for the HDR bracketed shots because I do work with a lot of HDR. It, it doesn't look like it because I'm, I'm, I, I try to keep it as natural looking as possible. Um, for video conversions, I use a program called Handbrake. It's free. It'll, it'll uh, convert any, any format to just about any other format. Adobe Premiere Pro for editing and Adobe After Effects for stabilization, usually. And then more drone resources. The FAA website is faa.gov forward slash UAS. There is a great website called Sky Vector, which does online sectional charts, and uh, and those are online real time. If you're if you're learning, go to skyvector.com. You can pull up any area. Uh, phone apps, which are good, is the FAA's got a, an app called Before You Fly, which will tell you if you are cleared to fly or if there are any restrictions. You may you may only go up to 100 feet or 200 feet. Um, there's a, a website called, uh, it's an app called UAV Forecast, which will give you weather forecasts. An app called Kitty Hawk, which I haven't used in a long time, which I think is very similar to Before You Fly. DJI's apps for, for flying the thing, um, they will tell you if you are in airspace or not. And uh, and I'm not getting into Lance and some of the uh, and some of the uh, some of the areas where you've got to get permission to to take off in and and tell them you're not going to act like an idiot. Um, there's a program called Litchi, an app called Litchi, which is a, uh, it's a drone flying program that uses the SDKs of the drones. So a lot of drones, you can fly in this alternative app. And at least for when I had the old DJI Mavic Mini, it gave that thing a little bit more, uh, a little bit more power to do things that, that the actual DJI app did not. Um, I really don't use it. I really don't use Litchi anymore. Uh, I use Drone Harmony for uh, for those crisscross maps, and then I use uh, it used to be called Verifly, but now it's called Thimble, and that is um, as you need it insurance for drones. I think it usually runs between five and ten dollars for half an hour's worth of like insurance. Like if you're flying somewhere and and you need to make sure you have a little extra insurance, you can you can buy it right then and there. The, the place that I highly recommend if you want to learn about your 107 is Remote Pilot 101, remotepilot101.com. Use the code HERON18 for 30% off the lifetime course. And because I know that that code, they, they gave me the code for our friend Ken Heron. I knew it was Ken's code, so I emailed Ken and made sure that uh, that, that worked out. Ken, if you get a million uh, signups, you owe me a crisp high five next time we see each other. And we are also on YouTube as well, John Electro Photography, and whenever we get a chance to do a little bit of travel stuff, we, we put some drone, some photography stuff. We gotta get back into that. We've got a lot of plans for this year. But uh, but that's pretty much it. Thank you guys. You have any questions? What's yes. The, what's the model of that drone? That's an old Air 2S. What is it? Air 2S. Air 2S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fred. Uh, I think with all the with all the batteries and, and everything was about two thousand dollars. Yeah. Did the camera and everything come with that? Oh yeah, it's all it's a one it's one whole unit. Okay, the camera looks great. Yeah, the question was um, the first question was what uh, what uh, model that was, and then uh, Fred asked about the question about the camera, and the camera is one one of the DJI's kind of like they have the pocket, same thing. It's complete stabilization head on that. I don't think it. I think it's. I think it's a. I know it was a larger sensor. Let's see if I can get my. 
get my glasses to figure it out. You're right, Ed. It's, it's a, it's a uh, one inch, 20 megapixel sensor. Yeah. Sue, did you have a question? I have three. Uh-oh. All are related. <laughs> Mm -hmm. balloon with all that old-fashioned camera gear, how did he compensate for the fact that the balloon is drifting along in the air? His first try didn't work out too well. And then he had a big balloon called Le Giant. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But it was a gigantic balloon that had almost what looked like a house and a, and a kind of a, a, an air, like a spectator's area up top. Um, I remember a story about th that thing getting loose and kind of crashing through towns and kind of wreck wreaking havoc. But uh, th from what I understand, they would tether that, they would have a giant balloon with a giant gun that would compensate for any of that movement. Yeah. Um, the other one with the camera hanging from the kite. The peak of it, yes. Even with the crisscross. Knowing what I've seen about how kites come down, whether they're well-controlled or not well-controlled, how do you grab the camera before it The question was, back with our uh, kite aerial photography stuff, how do you get the camera off the kite before, uh, before it crashes? Usually you need a, kind of like drones, you kind of need another person, you need a VO, a, a, a visual observer, but kind of like with drones, you really want to have somebody, as you're bringing that kite down, catch that. Now we're not talking about stunt kites or anything. We're talking about big delta kites, stuff that really shouldn't, you know, want to go too crazy on you. Where's that peak of it? There it is, right there. And even if you did, you know, you put a GoPro in that with one of those GoPro plastic cases, it hits the dirt, you just rinse it off. No big deal. Yeah. Had another question? Third question was when you were doing all that photographing at the OC air show. Mm -hmm. The actual Ocean City Air Show did, and they would contact and they would put our information out to the local newspapers. Yeah. And they use it for their own publicity for the next year. And the yeah. Next year. Yep. Yeah. Online, um, Harry is saying, John, did you let folks know that depending on the weight, they don't have to be registered, but they should anyways? Yeah, we talked a little bit about that um, bef before we started the, 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 um, the stream. Uh, you've got to register it if it's 250 grams or, or heavier, and then the upper limit on that is 55 pounds. If you've got a drone over 55 pounds, you're in a different class anyway. But... And and uh, and our friend Ken uh, would call the uh, uh, would call the drones underneath that limit the outlaw drones. People think they're the outlaw drones, but even though you don't need to register them, um, you really should anyway. You do need to take the, the FAA's trust exam, which is uh, I, I don't remember if it was free or if it was cheap. Was it free? Because Christine took it. Even though she's my visual observer for my 107 flight, she took the she took the free. Um, I think it's part 60, not part 61. Can't remember what it was, but um, part 61 is if you already have a a pilot's license, you can go through and you can pretty much skip all the craziness because you know it already. But um, but yeah, you really should. You really should uh, register it. Get your get your number on there that way. If uh, even if you lose it, and that's really good. If if the drone goes haywire, and thankfully I've never had a problem with that. If the drone goes haywire, they you know be able to find you, find you, and, and bring it back to you. The only problem is if it crashed through like uh, like a bank and took some money, they'd probably not not be very happy about that. Yeah, not really sure. We have any other questions? Sure. Yes. When I was at Ocean City, uh, you know that park they have. Instead of having followers, they had hundreds of drones there, and they're all programmed for different lights. Yeah, this park right here, Northside Park. Light and formation of everything was really neat. What Ed was talking about was um, Northside Park. Uh, I think they'll do it until I think they do it on the Sundays in the park when they do the ice cream Sundays. I think that's when they do it, and. Um, there, there's a, a company that will bring out, and instead of instead of fireworks shows, they will put, oh, I can't remember how many it was, at least a hundred drones, like little micro drones that know the spatial awareness of each other, and they'll do all kind of patterns and and stuff. I think they had that for the Olympics a couple yeah. years ago too. Lights, different color lights. Yeah. It's a really cool. I like the 
that park is Bayside, that's Bayward? Yeah, that's Bayside. Uh, I think it's 124th Street. It's a beautiful park. Whenever they do, uh, I think it's November to... January, first week in January. First week in January, they do the Winter Fest of Lights in that park. And there used to be, a, you go there and you get on the tram and the tram would run you around. It's, uh, uh, so many light displays around that park. But when COVID hit, they let people walk it. And people like the walking tour so much, I don't think they do the tram tour anymore. So you can walk it at your own pace, really nice. It's like six bucks to get in, it's, it's unreal. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything online? Fine then. Let me get back here. Yes, Bob. In drone, I've seen something called optical flow. <clears throat> what is that? Oh, you're gonna make me think. Optical flow, I think that's what DJI calls their um their the, the transmission between the camera of the drone and, and your and your view, if I'm thinking the right thing. Because when I fly a drone, I'm looking through that camera as I fly that drone, as you saw on the video. But I believe that's DJI's pat. If I remember correctly, I think that's DJI's patented technology for getting that 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 video from the drone to you as quickly as possible, so that you can you can maneuver around. So none of the drones have a down-looking camera and use that to control either their height or their motion. Well. And a DJ is kind of secretive with their technology. I'm not sure if they've ever come back out, but this camera will, will, will look down. I can look completely down. I can look up, but it will only go like 20%. There's not another camera at the bottom. Well, here's the thing. There's all this stuff on the bottom. This is a high-powered light. I can turn the light on. I also have a Velcro on top. Being a 107, I can fly night missions as long as I have a strobe on here that will go out three statute miles. I've got sensors on top, I've got sensors on the bottom, I've got sensors behind. The only sensors I don't have are the side sensors. So the only way I could crash this, unless there's a fluke of, of something, or maybe something that didn't detect, is if I'm, fly, if I'm strafing and videoing and, and or whatever. So that's what I'll usually do, is if I'm flying a mission where I'm strafing, I can do a practice run mission where it flies that same mission forward. That way, if anything's gonna get in the, 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 the vision of this sensor, it's gonna stop then I know I can strafe and I can, because with the, like Drone Harmony, I can sit there and say, okay, well, I wanna, I wanna focus on this point and then I wanna draw a line of where I want this to fly and it'll always face that point where it's flying. I can do that. Now, getting back to your question, allegedly, and uh, when you take this drone off and you fly it wherever you want and you hit the home button, I like bringing it back myself, but you can hit the home button, it'll come back down and land it's pretty close. Now, I've heard people speculate that this thing, one of the, that this guy here is a camera, and it takes kind of a little, little photo of the area you took off of. I don't know if that's true or not. But allegedly, it, took, it takes a little photo and it matches that up when it lands. I don't know about that. If you're watching it from the beach in Ocean City, <laughs> sand is sand is sand. It's gonna see nothing but sand for some oh, yeah. before it gets to the white view. Yeah. Now some people put, I've got a cup, so I've had people buy me the, the little, the little um, you know how the reflectors kind of pop out? But it's got like a big orange H on one side for a helipad. And then you can run that up and bring it back down. But I just find a piece of concrete and send it up. So I've never really tested it. But, uh, but yeah, you never want to launch it on sand, dirt, if you can help it. Uh, sometimes I've, I've had to launch it in kind of tall grass and I mow the grass until, it's, it, it, until it can, can grab enough air and go up. But uh, I mean, they're pretty durable. They're pretty darn durable. I've, I've run them into poles and stuff over water. Over water's crazy. So you'll never forget the first time you flew a drone over water. It's, uh, it's nerve wracking because if you lose control, <laughs> it's, a, it's an artificial reef now. That's where your observer stops. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> Any more questions? Any more questions online? All right, well I thank everybody for coming out. That's my info for anybody online that doesn't know who he is. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. What is next week? Next week is the digital contest. Do not come in. Do not come to the church next week. This is gonna be an entirely online thing. 
just like we usually do the second Thursday. And then Saturday is a field trip to St. Michael's. Should be a lot of fun. The 16th is uh, Lori Lankford with Looks Like a Painting, uh, Monochrome and Color Contest themed glass on the 23rd. And March 2nd, Padma Nguva. Sorry again, Padma, if I'm saying your name wrong, with a program on floral photography. Should be a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Good night.